Hi, I'm Barb Nangle. I'm the founder of Higher Power Coaching and Consulting. I want to welcome you to my podcast, Fragmented to Whole, Life Lessons from 12-Step Recovery. On this podcast, I share my experience, strength, and hope from recovery. I don't support or endorse any particular 12-Step Recovery Fellowship, and I don't claim to speak for any of them either. My hope is that you will find my words helpful in some way, whether you're in recovery or not. This is episode 107, The Importance of Boundaries in 12-Step Recovery, Learning from the Outside In. Most people in recovery who know they don't have healthy boundaries know things like they let people take advantage of them or they're constantly jumping to the rescue of others and that these are examples of poor boundaries. They often don't recognize that they're probably also trampling all over other people's boundaries. Well, 12-step recovery helps us with both. These are what I call boundaries of self-containment and boundaries of self-protection. I have an entire episode on the distinction between those two. It's episode 43, if you'd like to listen. When I was learning how to form boundaries, I needed them to be imposed from the outside first. I just didn't have the wherewithal to create healthy boundaries on my own. And 12-step recovery helped me with that. I'm going to share a bunch of those ways here, starting with some slogans and sayings, then some common meeting practices, and then some of the 12 traditions to illustrate how 12-step recovery helps us with boundaries by imposing them from the outside first. That's so that we can eventually learn how to form them internally for ourselves. For those of you who are not in 12-step recovery, who listen to this podcast, you may not know that in addition to the 12 steps, we also have 12 traditions. Technically, they're called 12-step and 12-tradition programs. And I'll be referring to some of the traditions later on in this episode. So that's what that's about. And you can Google them and you'll find them. I'm going to start with the serenity prayer, which goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That prayer is all about learning how to discern where your boundaries are. That is learning the wisdom to know the difference between that which I can and cannot change. In other words, the difference between what's inside my boundary and what's outside my boundary. I personally have come an extremely long way in understanding what things I can and cannot change, but this is a task that I'll need to work on for the rest of my life. I think we all do. Life is so nuanced and there will always be situations arising where we need time to discern, wait, what can I control here? Of course, we get a lot better at understanding what we can and cannot control when we're in recovery. That's a huge part of what recovery is about. And um, what I'm saying here is that recovery in large part is about learning boundaries. This is such a difficult and important issue that we need continual reminders. The serenity prayer is so important. It's recited at the beginning and end of almost every recovery meeting. And it's basically about learning where your boundaries are and gaining the courage to change the things within your boundary, learning what are the things you can control and can't control, and learning how to accept the things outside of your boundary, the things you can't control. Now I'm going to move on to a few slogans. Just for today and one day at a time are about the boundary of living in the present day. That is, there's a boundary around the time you're to focus on. Don't live into the wreckage of the future and don't dwell on the wreckage of the past. Actually, quick side note, my sweetheart says about the past, look, don't stare, just like a rear view mirror. The reason we want to live in the boundary of today is that is the best way to have a well-lived life. And that is to live well today. And you cannot do that if you're focused on the past, 
and all the shit that happened, or if you're catastrophizing and living into the wreckage of the future. Then there's the slogan, live and let live. This is basically the serenity prayer in shortcut form. That means you live your life, not other people's lives. What's inside your boundary are the things you can control. Your mind, you mind your own business and stay out of other people's business. You're not letting others run your life either. And you're not trying to run other people's lives. That's outside your boundary. You can't control what's outside your boundary. Then there are some common meeting practices that happen in some fellowships and in some meetings, but not necessarily all fellowships or all meetings. And these help us by having the boundaries imposed from the outside first until we can learn to have our own healthy boundaries. I think the first real boundary I learned was the no crosstalk rule. This means not commenting on, referring to, or mentioning what other people share. The idea here is that their sharing is within their boundary and not yours. I learned to stop giving unsolicited advice from the no crosstalk rule. This is so important, especially for people who are in relationship recovery programs as opposed to substance recovery programs. Not that those folks don't need it too, or we folks. It helps me to live my own life without you telling me what to do or judging me or commenting on what I'm doing. Another common meeting practice that's an external boundary is timed shares. When I came into recovery, the meetings I went to, people could talk as long as they wanted when they shared. And there were times when people would talk for 20 or 30 minutes in an hour long meeting. And I have to say, I'm sure that I did that more than once myself. Then I started in another fellowship. And in that fellowship, all the shares were timed three minutes. That's it. It was just part of the normal practice of that fellowship. And I started to see how helpful that was that everyone was given equal time. There was a boundary around how much time people could take up in the meeting. No one was allowed to dominate the meeting with extremely long shares. Now, all the meetings I go to have three minute time shares and you can see the ease and the relaxation that happened in the meetings once we started adding timed shares. It's a boundary around how much time anyone is allowed to take. Before we had boundaries around people's shares, there was often tension, especially around someone who would share for like 15 to 30 minutes at a time. And that reminds me, meetings that begin and end on time are healthy meetings because they have healthy boundaries. People in recovery need structure, which is what boundaries are, by the way. Having meetings that begin and end on time are healthy. We're not allowing the meeting time to be blurry. It's clear. Clarity is healthy because we're not allowing the meeting to run into the rest of our lives. Now, if we decide we want to come early or stay late for fellowship, that's one thing, but the meeting itself should begin and end on time. The idea of rotation of service is another boundary. No one person is or should be in charge. There is a boundary on the amount of service any one person can give. This is especially important for people who have been codependent and are used to rescuing and saving others. It's also a way to put a boundary around people who are controlling and think they know everything. The point of having rotation of service is to put a limit on that so that no one person or no small group of people can be in charge of everything. No one is more important than others, and no one is in charge of 12-step meetings. I know this doesn't always happen in practice, but the principle exists in recovery for a reason. It's a boundary because we need these boundaries to be imposed on the outside first so that we can learn how to form them on our own eventually. There's a common saying in meetings, what's heard in the meeting stays in the meeting, and that's another boundary. It's a boundary around the group of people that were in the meeting. We're supposed to keep people's business private 
and inside the boundary of the beading. All right, now I'm going to transition to talking about the traditions. One of the things that people say in recovery is that the 12 steps are to keep us from committing suicide and the 12 traditions are to keep us from committing homicide. We could interpret that to mean that we're learning to have healthy boundaries. The 12 traditions teach us how to relate to the group and they teach meetings how to relate to other meetings and service bodies how to relate to other service bodies. Tradition four is about group autonomy. So in other words, we have a boundary such that what happens inside this group is nobody's business as long as it doesn't affect any of the other meetings or the fellowship as a whole. Tradition five says each fellowship has a primary purpose. So we have a boundary around what it is we're focusing on, and that is the only thing that we focus on. Tradition six says we don't have outside endorsements. In other words, we are taking care of ourselves inside the boundary. And tradition seven, we're self-supporting through our own contributions. We don't take outside money from anybody else. What happens inside this boundary is funded by the people inside this boundary. This one in particular has been really helpful for me, especially the part about letting others be self-supporting through their own contributions. Every single problem I ever had with money had to do with my codependence, not letting others be self-supporting through their own contributions or being worried about keeping up with the Joneses. Then there's tradition eight, and that says that we are will forever be non-professional. So we have a boundary about who's allowed to run the program. And that is the people in the program are the ones that run the program. Tradition 10 is we don't have opinions on outside issues. We're minding our own business. This is really good for people in recovery to learn since so many of us have been sticking our noses in other people's business for decades. And then tradition 12 is about anonymity. This is a huge one in terms of boundaries. There are a lot of reasons why anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our fellowships. It started because people had a lot of shame about being an alcoholic and they realized over time that anonymity had so many more implications than just avoiding the shame of public ridicule. Uh, number one is that anonymity means every voice in a meeting is equal. There's not supposed to be any one person whose opinion has more weight than anybody else. If the most famous or f powerful person in the world was in a recovery meeting, their perspective on recovery has no more weight than anybody else's. Each voice is just as valuable as the next. That's a boundary around our egos and around how important any one person can be in the meeting. When we keep anonymous who our sponsors and sponsees are, that puts a boundary around our business and around the fact that each person should have only one voice. Then nobody is in our business. If you're in a fellowship where everybody knows who everybody's sponsoring, who, that's not good. And here's why. Let's say that somebody in the meeting has 10 sponsees in the room and those 10 sponsees each have 10 sponsees in the room and everybody in the room who knows that person is the sponsor or grand sponsor of over 100 people in the room. That's going to affect what happens in the room. When that one person speaks, they don't have just one voice. All of their sponsees and grand sponsees and probably everybody else know that they're all connected. So when that person speaks, they have the weight of all those other people in their sponsorship line behind them. That means it's going to be very difficult for people to disagree with that person, no matter how wrong they are. That's one of the reasons why anonymity is so important in, in our 12-step recovery programs. It's to help us have just one voice and put a boundary around our egos. Anonymity also means we can't let any one member speak publicly for a fellowship. 
That's why we have to maintain anonymity at the level of press, radio, film, and other forms of media. There is a boundary around who can speak for the fellowship, and it's not actually who, it's what. It's conference-approved literature and conference-approved bylaws that can speak for the fellowship. The fact that we have one voice means that we are one among many, and that is humility in action. Humility means you're no better and no worse than anyone else. If you think you have it way worse than anybody else, or that you are the worst person who has ever lived, anonymity reminds us to be humble and remember you're no better and no worse than anyone else. That means it doesn't matter how much money we have or how little, how much education we have or how little, how much life experience we have or how little, how much intelligence we have or how little, how much power we have or how little. We're all the same because we suffer from the same illness and we're there because of that. The boundaries of the program are what hold us all in. To recap, 12-step recovery helps us to learn boundaries from the outside first through these various means so that we can learn how to develop our internal boundaries. These means of learning boundaries include the serenity prayer, some slogans of the program, and a variety of common meeting practices, as well as the 12 traditions. Because boundaries keep us safe, they help us know where we end and other people begin, where our responsibility and our control ends and where other people's begins so that we can stay within our hula hoop, within our boundary and have the courage to change what's going on inside our boundary if it's not working for us and the ability to accept what's going on outside our boundary. Once we get the wisdom to know what's inside and what's outside the boundary, that is. Now, if this episode resonated with you, I have a ton of resources on boundaries on Instagram. If you aren't already following me there, I'm at Higher Power Coaching, and you can scroll back and see a ton of stuff that will help you with boundaries. And of course, I also do private and group coaching on boundaries as well. Well, that's it for today, friends, loved ones, and strangers. Remember, it's never too late to recover. Healing is possible for everyone, even you, and no one is beyond hope. Talk to you next week. That's it for today. Please share this episode with anyone who might find it helpful. If you like what you've heard here, you might be interested in private coaching with me. If that sounds like you, then head on over to barbchat.net or you can get on my calendar for a free 20 minute consultation to help you make lasting changes in your life. Like I've made deep lasting changes in my life. My ideal client is someone who is ripe for change, but I'll coach anyone who wants to be happy, joyous, and free. So if that's you, then go to barbchat.net and get on my calendar. I'd love to chat with you. Please like and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast outlet. This helps other people find me. Thanks for listening.